welcome to our series on St. Matthew's Gospel. We are looking at chapter 20 and the development in all of the teaching of Jesus as he walks towards Jerusalem and towards the culmination of his life. And he is trying to get his apostles to understand um, and to realize that the way he is going to reign is when he has paid a horrendous price for our redemption. He has been trying to tell them that the first will be last and the last will be first. He's been trying to say to them that if they want to become great, they have to go in a different direction than they are thinking at the moment because they think being great is having a big job in a government uh, and ruling people and therefore having lots of money and uh, land and servants and all the rest of it. In other words, truly worldly. And Jesus is in a different world altogether to that. And so the key verse in the gospel to explain Jesus of Nazareth is actually chapter 20, verse 28. This is what he says. Just as the Son of Man came on earth in the incarnation understood, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he is telling them there that he is their model and that if he is divine and human and he is the Messiah and he is the king uh, of, uh, he is the rightful king, uh, Davidic king, uh, then he is the model for them. They should be following him. And that in the kingdom that he is founding, that the way up is down. The way down is up. So if they want to have a high place in the kingdom of God, they've got to go way down in humility and in service to others. If you puff yourself up as somebody very important, then you're heading down. You're not in, a, in a, at the right place at all. Um, and so, you know, this reminds us of what St. Matthew has told us uh, as we went through the gospel in chapter eight, verse 17, that he took our sicknesses and he carried our diseases for us. Uh, he was quoting Isaiah 53, four. And in Matthew 12, 18, here is my servant whom I have chosen uh, my beloved, the favourite of my soul. And there he, Matthew was quoting Isaiah 42, verse 1. So if Jesus came specifically in the incarnation to give his life as a ransom for many, then he's telling his disciples if they are capable of hearing it, but well, we know that before the Passion, they were really not capable of hearing it. He's telling them that he was going to buy us back from Satan, that the, the rebellion of the human race against God gave Satan power to reign on the earth. And because Satan was reigning on the earth, uh, Satan was destroying everything. And if Jesus was to get it all back into God's order, then he was going to have to pay a very high price for that. So the ransom for many is actually quite important. And I'll just read a, a, a small bit from Isaiah 53 verses 11 and 12. When his soul's anguish is over, he shall see the light and be content. And by his suffering shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Now, they knew the scriptures. They may not have known them as well as the scribes and Pharisees knew them, but they knew the prophecies about the Messiah. And so Jesus is reminding them that the prophecies have already told them what his destiny is and that this should not be a complete surprise for them. So they're almost uh, in Jerusalem. They're on this final journey to Jerusalem and they're approaching Jerusalem from Jericho and as they approach Jerusalem from Jericho, the first village they meet is called Bethphage. Um, and it's only, you know, very, very close uh, to the city. Um, but as they were leaving the town of Jericho, um, Matthew says, a large crowd followed him. 
Now these are from the various towns that he has been working in and speaking in and they seem not to, willing to let Jesus go. And the amazing thing is that in a very short time, they're all going to cry for his death. It's amazing. The, the turnabout will be almost inexplicable. A large crowd followed him. Now there were two blind men sitting on the side of the road. Now if you go into Mark or Luke, there's one but you know that the two blind men, uh, Matthew is saying, uh, first of all, the Jews and Gentiles are blind. They need Jesus to give them sight. But in this particular context, where we've had James and John behaving in a very worldly way, the two blind men represent James and John. Most people don't see that. We understand the Jews and Gentiles bit because there are different layers, as you know, in reading the scriptures. And when they heard that it was Jesus who was passing by, they shouted, Lord, have pity on us, son of David. Ah, these two men are disciples. They're not calling him uh, anything, but directly calling him Lord and calling him son of David. Uh, so that goes back to Psalm 110 verse one. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand. And everybody knows that that particular Psalm is speaking about the Messiah. So these two men recognize Jesus as the Messiah and they recognize him as the son of David. And the crowd scolded them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted even more loudly. Lord, they said, have pity on us, son of David. So Jesus stopped, called them over and said, what do you want me to do for you? I absolutely love that question. The men are blind. The rest of us would presume what they want. But Jesus said, what do you want from me? They could want all kinds of things. And they said, Lord, that we may see, give us our sight back. Now, when they ask, because these men believe in him, they know who he is, and they have applied to him as Messiah and son of David, then when they ask for their sight back, they're saying, give us the ability to see God. Give us the ability to recognize his Messiah. Give us the ability to be able to perceive the things of God. Allow us to truly walk your journey back to God. Jesus felt compassion for them. He touched their eyes and immediately their sight returned and they followed him. Now, if you go back to Luke and Mark, this is the story of blind Bartimaeus, okay? But Matthew wants you to hear the layer that applies to James and John because their behavior in wanting the first and second places in the kingdom meant that they were still blind. They were not recognizing who Jesus really was and that Jesus is saying to them, please ask me to heal you and I will heal you and then you can truly follow me. Now, when these men follow Jesus, Jesus is going directly into Jerusalem, have a short Jerusalem ministry and then he's going to be killed. So they're joining Jesus at a very difficult time and they don't seem to worry about the cost of discipleship. The apostles are really worried about the cost of discipleship and Jesus has to see if he can bring them around. Jesus doesn't succeed in bringing the 12 around to his way of thinking before he died. And that must have been an incredible burden to him. So we go into chapter 21 and here we have Jesus uh, deliberately, consciously entering Jerusalem, not as a private citizen, not as a layman, not as somebody coming to worship the Lord, but as the Messiah of Israel coming to claim his capital city and his temple, his father's house. Now the people who understand his prophetic action more than anybody else are the Sanhedrin. They understand every move that he makes. And the more he shows them who he is, the more they hate him. They don't want him. When they came near Jerusalem, they came in sight of Bethphage, which is the first village they would meet uh, as they came into the city. Uh, 
because they're coming in from the Jericho Road and this was on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples ahead of him saying, go to the village facing you and you will immediately see a tethered donkey and a colt. Now, reading the four gospels and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, he's either on a donkey or on a colt. Matthew's the only one who tells you he has both. Don't forget the two blind men. The donkey and the colt are important. I'll give you that in a moment. Um, he said, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, which of course they would, why are you taking my animals, you know? Just say to them, the master needs them and will give them back to you immediately. Now, in his foreknowledge, now first of all, Jesus has this whole thing planned in his head. He doesn't tell anybody what his plans are. You might be able to guess the reason for that is that one of the apostles is a spy, Judas. So if Jesus tells his plans ahead of time, Judas is going to tell the Sanhedrin. But somehow he gets the message to them because the scribes and Pharisees turn up all, almost immediately, which is quite amazing. So Jesus tells the apostles to go to a particular house where he knows that the people in that house are his uh, disciples. And once they would say that it was simply the master uh, who wanted a loan of the animals, they would immediately allow it. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the donkey and the colt. So Matthew wants you to hear this uh, very clearly. First of all, he quotes uh, Isaiah 62, 11 and Zechariah 9, putting them together. Say to the daughter of Zion, look, your king comes to you. He is humble. He rides on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So Matthew's put two texts there together to put across the message that he wants to give you. Now, the donkey and the colt, they're real animals, but they are both symbolic. Jesus literally rides on the donkey, but Matthew gives you the impression that he somehow managed to uh, put a leg over the colt as well, which is amazing. The colt, you're told, had never been ridden before. And you're, you're specifically told that about the colt. And when Jesus is buried, you're specifically told that the tomb had never been used by anyone before. These are very specific um, uh, details that are necessary. represents the Gentiles who had never been evangelized before. The word of God had never been given to them. They were like an animal that hadn't been broken in. And that it is Jesus who wants to bring in the Gentiles with the Jewish people. Now that is the message that St. Paul gives you in Ephesians chapter 2, that Jesus broke down the wall that separated the Jews and the Gentiles and he brought them into the church making one new man out of them all so that they all become the redeemed of the Lord instead of what they were before whether they were Jews or Gentiles and that Jesus did that himself. So the colt and the donkey uh, is actually a, a very important sign. Um, you do know that the donkey is stubborn and quite hard to teach and that's exactly Jesus' experience in dealing with Israel. She has been very hard to teach. Um, but the donkey also symbolizes meekness and lowliness um, and is the transport of the poor. Uh, if Jesus was giving a message that he wanted to be crowned king, he would not travel on a donkey, even though King David actually entered Jerusalem on a donkey 10 centuries previously. So in traveling on the donkey, Jesus is saying, I am the descendant of King David that you have been looking for. I am the Messiah that you have been looking for, but I'm not the Messiah that your modern thinking has produced. And that is 
if the Messiah, according to their image, had entered Jerusalem, he would be riding on horseback because the horse was a symbol of war and the donkey was a symbol of peace. The horse was a symbol of the rich, the donkey was a symbol of the poor. And Jesus always identified with the poor and the lowly. He never identified with the rich, ever. Um, and so the message that he is giving to them is, is actually quite clear. Um, but when you go back to the prophets, for example, Isaiah 62, 11 and Zechariah 9, 9, they both told Israel that their Messiah would come into the city riding on a donkey and a colt. So this is not completely new. And it was normal for them that a prophet would give them prophetic action as well as words. And the prophetic action of Jesus is telling them who he is, that he is coming as the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace was announced by Isaiah in chapter nine and verse nine, and was announced by the angels at the birth of Christ, that he was the Prince of Peace and that he was coming to bring peace on earth. So that was the very purpose of his coming. So this Messiah is completely different to the one that the Sanhedrin is expecting, that the people are expecting, or the apostles are expecting, but John the Baptist had got it right. He was a meek lamb of God, and he was going to be sacrificed on their behalf. John the Baptist got it, but the others didn't get it. Even when John the Baptist told them, they still didn't get it, because if your mind is fixed on an idea, and I give you another idea, you just throw out my idea and stay with your own fixed idea, because the mind was closed, okay? In verse six and seven, the disciples went out and obeyed Jesus. And so they, when they brought the animals back, they took their, what, what the, my translation says is their cloaks. Um, the Jewish people called their outer garment a mantle, not a cloak. And it was a very, very wide garment and it would actually wrap two or three times around the body. It was their raincoat if it was raining, it was their blanket at night. It was their everything garment. Now, because this mantle actually rested on their shoulders, they considered that if they were giving authority to somebody, that the authority is on their shoulders. And this is what Isaiah said in chapter nine as well, that the government will be upon his shoulders. And so the old traditional way of declaring somebody king was to take the mantle off your shoulders and put it under him so that he was sitting on it. That means I give authority to you. So first of all, they put their mantles on the, the animals. But of course, the animals could only take one or two mantles. So what they started doing was, as the animals moved forward, they would put their mantles on the ground for Jesus to walk on them. That means you have authority over us. We give you this authority. That is proclaiming him king. That is the way they did it in the ancient times. Um, so they laid their cloaks uh, on the backs of the animals. That's verse seven. And Jesus sat on them. Great crowds of people spread their cloaks on the road as well, while others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the path. That is uh, smoothing the path for this king. The crowds who went in front uh, and those who followed began shouting something terribly important. The translation says, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessings on him who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. Now that is a quotation from Psalm 118. And it's actually quite important to go back to it because Psalm 118 is the processional psalm for the Feast of Tabernacles. And one of the things that the, the, the psalm actually speaks about being hard pressed and suffering, but the Lord has helped me. And then from verse 19, it says, open to me the gates of holiness. I will come, I will enter and give thanks. 
It's the Lord's own gateway. It's the gateway that the, the virtuous will enter in. And I thank you for having heard me, even though I am the stone rejected by the builders, but I prove to be the keystone. This is the Lord's own doing, and it is wonderful to see. This is the day made memorable by the Lord. What immense joy it is. Please, Lord, come and save us. In their language, it's Hoshiana. Please, Lord, come and save us. So the crowds that are proclaiming Jesus King are actually saying the exact right thing to Jesus. Hoshiana, come and save us now. And they're also giving to him the greeting that you're told in Psalm 118 was the correct greeting to give to the Messiah. Baruch Abba Vashem Adonai. Blessings on him who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's actually very important. And it's the Psalm that gives you the words. And Matthew quotes them. So they say the right thing to Jesus. And Jesus has come to Jerusalem not to reign as a human king, not to be crowned as an ordinary King David, not to live in a palace, not to set up a human government, not to do any of the things that they think he's going to do, but he's coming to save them. Do you think any of them appreciate what he's going to do for them? No, not one. Not even his apostles appreciate it, okay? And Matthew says something very, very important. He says it in verse 10. When he entered Jerusalem this way, riding on a donkey, with all these crowds proclaiming him the Messiah and the Davidic king, of course, everybody in Jerusalem gets the message. They know this sign. This sign is recognized by absolutely everybody. And uh, Matthew says, the whole city was in turmoil. Now you have to go back to Matthew chapter two, when Jesus entered into the land of Palestine on the day of his birth, you're told that the whole city was in turmoil. That means that the leadership are in turmoil. And Matthew says it was a seismos, that it was an earthquake. And that Jesus created a political and religious earthquake on his arrival in Bethlehem uh, at, at Christmas time and on his arrival in Jerusalem as an adult to declare himself the Messiah. This means that Jesus has to say and do very little to disturb the leadership to their very core. Because if he is the Messiah, if he is what he says he is, the Son of God, and he is what they know he is, that is the Davidic king, then it means their day for ruling Israel is over. It means the Herods are gone. He wouldn't tolerate the Herods. Uh, it means that the Sanhedrin is gone because he wouldn't tolerate the abuse that was going on in the temple. And so they, all the people in power are in turmoil and they're the ones who decide it's either him or us. It can't be both. They all actually know that that is the truth. But the people are saying, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Oh dear. I'll pick that up the next time. Imagine having the wrong address. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus live. Goodbye. God bless you.